Okay, we're gonna try this again. Hi. Okay, now I think it's working. Can you hear me now? Okay, that was so weird. I literally, what happened? I literally started it. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Um, I started it before and then um, for some reason it said there was like one person in here and no one could hear me. Um, hi, sorry that messed up again. It messes up every time. Um, anyways, um, were any of you guys here last time I read? Or are you guys all new to this? Um, because I was going to read another chapter. If you don't want to stick around, you don't have to. But um, if you love Harry Potter, then yeah, come stick around. Um, unfortunately, I read ahead earlier this morning. So I'm about like 50 pages ahead of where we left off last time. Um, but most of you must know what this story is. So hopefully you'll be able to catch on. Um, yeah, story time. If you want to listen, please feel free to listen. Put your phone down. Do whatever you're doing. Um, I'm just going to read a chapter. Um, and you can listen. If it bores you, you don't have to listen. I'm also going to try to keep this one on my Instagram because last time some people were upset they missed it. And people always are like, tell us when you're live streaming. But to be honest, I have no idea when I'm going to go live. Um, it's usually like a if I'm feeling it kind of thing. Got my espresso. Um, but because of that, I think I'm gonna um, keep this one. Um. <laughs> Hi guys. Oh, you guys are sweet. Um, okay, I'm gonna read a chapter. Um, I'm gonna do the same thing I did last time in a pretty crappy British accent because it makes it more fun. And I'm not a great public reader, <laughs> just warning you. I don't know how to say a lot of words in this book. Um, but it's gonna be fun. I'll give you like a little what just happened. I think we last read, there was, um, they did the sorting hat and Harry and everyone got sorted into their own houses at Hogwarts. And recently Harry has joined the Quidditch team and they won the first game. That's exciting. And Draco's still a little bitch. Um, and yeah, that's everything that has happened so far. So, we are now on chapter 12. It is called, uh, see, I don't even know this word. The Mirror of Erised, Erised? I have no idea if I'm saying that right. Um, my English accent offends you, I'm so sorry, okay? I'm not saying it's good, I just, it's fun, okay? So listen to Harry Potter in a poorly done British accent and enjoy. <clears throat> Christmas was coming. One morning in mid-December, Hogwarts woke to find itself covered in several feet of snow. The lake froze solid at the Weasley, and the Weasley twins were punished for being... And the Weasley twins were punished for bewitching several snowballs so that they followed Quirrell around, bouncing off the back of his turban. The few owls that had managed to battle the way through the stormy sky to deliver mail had to be nursed back to health by Hagrid before they could fly off again. No one could wait for the holiday to start. While Gryffindor Common Room, while the Gryffindor Common Room and the Great Hall had roaring fires, the drafty corridors had become icy, and the bitter wind rattled the windows in the classrooms. Worst of all were Professor Snape's classes down in the dungeons, where their breath rose in a mist before them, and they kept as close as possible to the hot cauldrons. I do feel sorry, said Draco Malfoy, one potion class for all those people who have to stay in Hogwarts for Christmas because they are not wanted at home. He was looking over at Harry as he spoke. Crab and Goyle chuckled. Harry, who was measuring out powder spine of lionfish, ignored them. Malf Malfoy had been even more unpleasant than usual since the Quidditch match, disgusted that the Slytherins had lost. He had, he had tried to get everyone laughing at how a wide-mouthed tree frog would be replacing Harry as a seeker next. Then he'd realized that nobody found this funny because they were all so impressed at the way Harry had managed to stay on his bucking broomstick. 
So Malfoy, jealous and angry, had gone back to taunting Harry about having no proper family. It was true that Harry wasn't going back to Pivot Drive for Christmas. Professor McGonagall had come around the week before, making a list of students who would be staying for the holidays, and Harry had signed up at once. He didn't feel sorry for himself at all. This would probably be the best Christmas he'd ever had. Ron and his brothers were staying too, because Miss and Mrs. Weasley were going to Romania to visit Charlie. When they left the dungeons at the end of the potions, they found a large fir tree blocking the corridor ahead. Two enormous feet sticking at, out at the bottom and a loud puffing sound told them that Hagrid was behind it. Hi Hagrid, want any help? Ron asked, sticking his head through the branches. Nah, I'm all right, thanks Ron. Would you mind moving it out of the way? Came Malfoy's cold draw from behind them. Are you trying to earn some extra money, Weasley, hoping to be gamekeeper for yourself when you leave Hogwarts, I suppose? That hut of Hagrid's must seem like a place, a palace compared to what your family's used to. Such a bitch. Weasley! Ron let go of the front of Malfoy's robes. He was provoked, Professor Snape said Hagrid, sticking his huge hairy face out from behind the tree. Malfoy was insulting his family. Be that as it may, fighting is against Hogwarts rules, Hagrid uh, said Snape silkingly. Silkily? Silkily. Well, uh, five points from Gryffindor. Weasley, and be grateful it isn't more. Move along, all of you. Malfoy, Crabbe, and Goyle pushed through past the trees, scattering needles everywhere and smirking. I'll get him, said Ron, grinding his teeth at Malfoy back. One of these days, I'll get him. I hate them both, said Harry, Malfoy and Snape. Come on, cheer up, it's nearly Christmas, said Hagrid. Tell you what, come with me and see the great hole looks a treat. So the three of them followed Hagrid and his tree off to the great hole where Professor McGonagall and Professor Flit Flitwick were busy with the Christmas decorations. Ah, Hagrid, the tree. Put it in the far corner, would you? The hole looked spectacular. Festoons of holly and mistletoe hung all over the walls and no less than 12 towering Christmas trees stood around the room, some sparkling with tiny icicles, some glittering with hundreds of candles. How many days you got left until your holidays? Hagrid asked. Just one, said Hermione. And that reminds me, Harry, Ron, we've got half an hour before lunch. We should be in the library. Oh yeah, you're right, said Ron, tearing his eyes away from Professor Flitwick. Who'd gone, uh, who had gold, golden bubbles blossoming out of his wand and was trailing them over the branches of the new tree. The library, said Hagrid, following them out of the hall. Just before the holidays, but keen, aren't you? Oh, we're not working, Harry told them brightly. Ever since you mentioned Nicholas Flamel, we've been trying to find out who he is. You what? Hagrid looked shocked. Listen here, I've told you, drop it. It's nothing to you what that dog's got in. We just want to know who Nicholas Flamel is. That's all, said Hermione. A espresso break. Ahem. I lost my spot. Okay. Uh, unless you'd like to tell us and save us the trouble, Harry asked. We mustn't, uh, what? we must have been through hundreds of books already and we can't find him anywhere. Just give us a hint. I know I've read his name somewhere. I'm not saying nothing, said Hagrid flatly. Just have to find out for yourselves then, said Ron, and they left. Hagrid looking disgruntled and hurried off into the library. They had indeed been searching books for Flamel's name ever since Hagrid had let it slip, because how else were they going to find out what Snape was hiding and trying to steal? The trouble was it was very hard to know where to begin, not knowing what Flamel might have done to get himself into a book he wasn't in the great wizards of the 20th century, all notable magic names of our time. He was missing too from important modern magical discoveries and a study of recent developments in wizardry. And then of course, there was the sheer size of the library, tens of thousands of books, thousands of shelves, hundreds of narrow rows. Hermione took out a list of subjects and titles she had uh, decided to search while Ron strode down a row of books and started pulling them off the shelves at random. Harry wandered over to the restricted section. He had been wondering for a while if Flamel wasn't somewhere in there. Unfortunately, you need a, spe a specially signed note from one of the teachers to look in any of the restricted books, and he knew he'd never get one. 
These were the books containing powerful dark magic never taught at Hogwarts and only read by older students studying advanced defense against the dark arts. What are you looking for, boy? Oh, nothing, said Harry. Madame Pence, the library librarian, brandished a feather duster at him. You better get out then go on out. Wishing he had been a bit quicker and thinking up some story, Harry left the library. He, Ron, and Hermione had already agreed they better not ask Madame Pence where they could find Flamel. They were sure they, she'd be able to tell them, but they couldn't risk Snape hearing what they were up to. Harry waited outside in the corridor to see, uh, see if the other two had found anything, but he wasn't very hopeful. They had been looking for two weeks after all, but they only had old moments, odd moments between lessons. It wasn't surprising they'd found nothing. What they really needed was a nice long search without Madame Pence breathing down their necks. Five minutes later, Ron and Hermione joined him, shaking their heads. They went off to lunch. You will keep looking while I'm away, won't you? said Hermione. And send me an owl if you find anything. And you could ask your parents if they know who Flamel is, said Ron. It'd be safe to ask them. Very safe. They're both dentists, said Hermione. Ugh. I'm out of breath. Reading is hard. I never did this in school. <laughs> um, fun fact, my dad is also a dentist, Hermione. Woohoo. Okay. You and I say Madame Pence very different. How do you say it? <laughs> I'm not saying my accent's good. It's just, you can't read Harry Potter in an American accent. See, look, watch, it's just wrong. Once the holidays had started, Ron and Hermione were, oh, sorry, Ron and Harry were having too good of a time to think about Flamel. Like, that just sounds wrong. Um, so I'm not going to do it. Okay, I'm going to keep going. I don't have that much left. I'm only going to do a couple more pages. <clears throat> Once the holidays had started, Ron and Harry were having uh, too good of a time to think much about Flamel. They had the dormitory to themselves. And the common room was far emptier than usual, so they were able to get the mood, uh, to get the good armchairs by the fire. They sat by the hour, the hour, they sat by the hour eating anything they could spare on a toasting fork. Bread, English muffins, marshmallows, and plotting ways of getting Malfoy expelled, which were far too fun to talk about, even if they wouldn't work. Ron also started teaching Harry wizard chess. This was exactly like muggle chess, except the figures were alive, which made it a lot like directing troops in a battle. Ron's set was very old and battered, like everything else he owned, but uh, it had once belonged to someone else in his family, in this case, his grandfather. However, old chessmen weren't a drawback at all. Ron knew them, so he had never had any trouble getting them to do what he wanted. Harry played with chessmen Seamus Finnegan had left him, and they didn't trust him at all. He wasn't a very good player yet, and he kept shouting different bits of advice, which was confusing. Don't send me there. Can't you see his knight? Send him. We can't afford to lose him. On Christmas Eve, Harry went to bed looking forward to the next day for the food and the fun, but not expecting presents at all. When he woke early in the morning, however, the first thing he saw was a small pile of packages at the foot of his bed. Merry Christmas, said Ron sleepily as Harry scrambled out of bed and pulled on his bathrobe. You too, Harry. Will you look at this? I've got some presents. What did you expect, Turnips? said Ron, turning his own pile, which was a lot bigger than Harry's. Harry picked up the top parcel. It was wrapped in a thick brown paper and scrawled across it was to Harry from Hagrid. Inside was a roughly cut wooden flute. Hagrid had obviously witted it him himself. Harry blew it. It sounded a bit like an owl. A second, very small parcel contained a note. We received your message and enclosed your Christmas present from Uncle Vernon and Aunt Petunia. Taped to the note was a 50 pence piece. That's friendly, said Harry. Ron was fascinated by the 50 pence. Weird. What a shape. This is money. You can keep it, said Harry, laughing at how pleased Ron was. Hagrid and my aunt and uncle. Who sent these? I think I know who that one's from, said Ron, turning a bit pink and pointing to a very lumpy parcel. My mum... I told her you didn't expect any presents, and oh no, oh, she's made you a Weasley sweater. Harry had torn open the parcel to find a thick, hand-knitted sweater in emerald green and a large box of homemade fudge 
every year she makes us a sweater said Ron unwrapping his own and mine's always maroon that's really nice of her said Harry trying the fudge which tasted very nasty tasty not nasty see I can't read um where was I uh his next present also contained candy a large a large box of chocolate frogs from Hermione this only left one parcel Harry picked it up and felt it. It was very light. He unwrapped it. Something fluid and silvery gray went slithering to the floor where it lay. Gleaming folds, Ron gasped. Oh, I've heard of those, he said in a hushed voice, dropping the box of every flavor beans he's ever gotten from Hermione. If that's what I think it is, they're really rare and really valuable. What is it? Harry picked up the shiny, silvery cloth off the floor. It was strange to the touch, like water woven into material. It's an invisibility cloak, said Ron, a look of awe on his face. I'm sure it is. Try it on. Harry threw the cloak around his shoulders, and Ron gave a yell. It is! Look down! Harry looked down at his feet, but they were gone. He dashed to the mirror. Sure enough, his reflection looked back at him. Just his head suspended into the mid-air, and his body completely invisible. He pulled the cloak over his head, and his reflection vanished completely. There's a note, said Ron suddenly. A note fell out of it. Harry pulled off the cloak and seized the letter, written in uh, written in narrow, loopy writing he had never seen before were the following words. Your father left this in my possession before he died. It's time it was returned to you. Use it well. A very Merry Christmas to you. Hold on. Gotta take a sip. <sighs> okay. <laughs> there was no signature. Harry stared at the note. Ron was admiring the cloak. I'd give anything for one of these, he said. Anything. What's the matter? Nothing, said Harry. He felt very strange. Who had sent the cloak? Had it really once belonged to his father? Before he could say or think anything else, the dormitory door was flung open and Fred and George Weasley bounded in. Harry stuffed the cloak quickly out of sight. He didn't feel like sharing it with anyone else. <clears throat> Merry Christmas! Blah, blah. Merry Christmas! Hey, look, <laughs> Harry's got a Weasley sweater too. Fred and George were wearing blue ones with a large yellow F and the other a G. Harry's is better than ours though, said Fred, holding up Harry's sweater. She obviously makes more of an effort when you're not family. Why aren't you wearing yours, Ron? Demanded George. Come on, get it on. They're lovely and warm. Oh, I hate maroon. Ron moaned half-heartedly as he pulled it over his head. You haven't gotten a letter on yours, George observed. I suppose she thinks you don't forget your name, but we're not stupid. We know we're called George, Gred and Forge. Funny, JK. <laughs> What's all this noise? Percy Weasley stuck his head through the door, looking disapprovingly. He had clearly gotten halfway through unwrapping his presents, too. Uh, he carried a lumpy sweater over his arm, which Fred seized. P for perfect. Get it on, Percy. Come on, we're all wearing ours. Harry's even got one. I don't want, said Percy thickly, as the twins forced the sweater over his head, looking at his glasses askew. And you're not sitting with the perfects today either, said George. Christmas is for family. They frog marched Percy from the room, his arms pinned side by his sweater. Wow. That's lovely. Um, how y'all doing? I feel like this is a very boring chapter. I'm so sorry. But I do love the invisibility cloak. <clears throat> Harry had never in his life had such an amazing Christmas dinner. A hundred fat roasted turkeys, mountains of roasted uh, of roast and boiled potatoes, Platters of chipolatas, chipolatas, terrines of buttered peas, silver boats of thick, rich gravy and cranberry sauce, and a stack of wizard crackers every few feet along the table. These fantastic party favors were nothing like the feeble muggle ones the Dursleys usually brought with their little plastic toys and their flimsy paper hats inside. Harry pulled a wizard cracker with Fred and... Uh, and it didn't just bang, it went off with a blast like a cannon and engulfed them all in a cloud of blue smoke while from the inside exploded a rear... What? A rear admiral's hat and several live white mice. Up at the high table, Dumbledore had swapped his pointed wizard's hat for a flowered bonnet 
and was chuckling merrily at a joke Professor Flitwick had just read him. Flaming Christmas pudding followed the turkey. Percy nearly broke his teeth on a, civil, a silver sickle embedded in his slice. Harry watched Hagrid getting redder and redder in the face as he called for more wine, finally kissing Professor McGonagall on the cheek, who, to Harry's amazement, giggled and blushed, her top hat lopsided. Everybody's drunk! Uh, when Harry finally left the table, he was laden down with a, sack, a stack of things. I can't talk anymore. <laughs> when Harry finally left the table, he was laden down with a stack of things out of, out of the crackers, including a pack of non-explodable luminous balloons, a grow-your-own waltz kit, and his own new wizard chess set. The white mice had disappeared, and Harry had a nasty feeling they were going to end up at Mrs. Norris's Christmas dinner. Harry and the Weasleys spent a happy afternoon having a furious furious, yeah, furious snowball fight on the grounds. Then cold, wet, and gasping for breath, they returned to the fire in the Gryffindor common room, where Harry broke in his new chess set by losing spectacularly to Ron. He suspected he wouldn't have lost so badly if Percy hadn't tried to help him so much. After a meal of turkey sandwiches, crumpets, Jesus, these people eat a lot, uh, and Christmas cake, everyone felt too full and sleepy to do much before bed, except sit and watch Percy chase Fred and George all over the, the Gryffindor Tower because they had stolen his perfect badge. It had been Harry's best Christmas day ever, yet something had been nagging him in the back of his mind all day. Not until he climbed into bed, he was free to think about it, the invisibility cloak and whoever had sent it. Ron, full of turkey and cake, and with nothing mysterious to bother him, fell asleep almost as soon as he'd drawn the curtains of his full poster. Of his full poster? What, what's a four poster? Do you guys know? Uh, okay. Harry leaned over the side of his own bed and pulled the cloak out from under it. His father's. It, has been his, it had been his father's. He let the material flow over his hands, smoother than silk, light as air. Use it well, the note had said. He had to try it now. He slipped out of bed and wrapped the cloak around himself. Looking down at his legs, he saw only moonlight and shadows. It was a very funny feeling. Use it well. Suddenly, Harry felt wide awake. The hall of Hogwarts was open to him in this cloak. Excitement flooded through him as he stood there in the dark and silence. He could go anywhere in this, anywhere, and Flint would, Filch would never know. Ron grunted in his sleep. Should Harry wake him? Something held him back, his father's cloak. He felt, at this time, the first time he wanted to use it alone. He crept out of the dormitory, down the stairs, across the common room, and climbed through the portable hall. Who's there? Squawked the fat lady. Harry said nothing. He walked quickly down the corridor. Where should he go? He stopped, his heart racing, and thought. And then it came to him, the restricted section in the library. Uh, he'd be able to read as long as he liked, as long as it looked, as long as it took to find out who Flamel was. He set off, drawing the invisibility cloak right around him as he walked. The library was pitch black and eerie. Harry lit a lamp to see his way along the row of books. The lamp looked as if it was floating in mid-air, even though Harry could feel his arm supporting it. And sight gave him the creeps. I don't know about you, but this part in the movie, there's that like terrifyingly creepy music, and as a child, literally terrified me. It was so scary. I like still... <sighs> Freaks me out. Okay. <clears throat> the restricted section was right at the back of the library. Stepping carefully over the rope that separated these books from the rest of the library, he held up his lamp to read the titles. They didn't tell him much. The appealing faded gold letters spelled words and languages Harry couldn't understand. Some had no title at all. One book had a dark stain that looked horribly like blood. The hairs on the back of Harry's neck prickled. Maybe he was imagining it, maybe not, but he thought of a faint whispering was coming from the books, as though they knew someone was there who shouldn't be. He had to start somewhere. Setting the lamp down, he carefully, uh, set, setting the lamp down carefully on the floor, he looked along the bottom shelf for an interesting looking book. A large and silver volume caught his eye. He pulled it out with difficulty because it was very heavy and balancing on his knee, let it fall open. 
A piercing, blood-curdling shriek split the silence. The book was screaming. Harry snapped it shut, but the shriek went on and on, one high, unbroken, ear-splitting note. He stumbled backward and knocked over his lamp, which went out at once. Panicking, he heard footsteps coming down the corridors outside. Stuffing the shrieking book back on the shelf, he ran for it. He passed Filch in the doorway. Filch's pale, wide-eyed look straight through him. And Harry slipped under Filch's outstretched arms and stru uh, streaked off. Streaked? <laughs> Sorry, I'm 12. Streaked off up the corridor. Uh, the book's shrieks <laughs> still ringing in his ears. He came to a sudden halt in front of the tall suit of armor. He had been so busy getting away from the library, he hadn't paid attention to where he was going. Perhaps because it was dark, he didn't recognize where he was at all. There was a suit of armor near the kitchens, he knew, but he must have followed, uh, he, but he must be five floors above there. You asked me to come directly to you, Professor. If anyone was wandering around at night and somebody's been in the library, restricted section. Harry felt the blood drain out of his face. Wherever he was, Filch must know a shortcut because his soft, greasy voice was getting nearer and nearer to him. And his horror, 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 horror. I don't know how to do that in a British accent, sorry. <clears throat> I lost my spot again. Ha! It was Snape <laughs> who replied, the restricted section. Well, they can't be far. We'll catch, the, we'll catch them. Harry stood rooted to the spot as Filch and Snape came around the corner ahead. They couldn't see him, of course, but it was a narrow corridor. And if they came much nearer, they'd knock right into him. The cloak didn't stop him from being solid. He backed away as quietly as he could. A door stood ajar to his left. It was his only hope. He squeezed through it, holding his breath, trying not to move, and to his relief, he managed to get inside the room without their noticing anything. They walked straight past, and Harry leaned against the wall, breathing deeply, listening to their footsteps dying away. That had been close, very close. It was a few seconds before he noticed anything about the room he had hidden in. It looked like an unused classroom. The dark shapes of desks and chairs were piled against the walls, and there was an, uh, an upturned wastebasket but propped against the wall facing him was something that didn't look as if it belonged there, something that looked as if it had been put there to keep out of the way. It was a magnificent mirror, as high to the ceiling with an ornate gold frame standing on two clawed feet. There was an inscription carved around the top. Oh, God. Erised stra eru oitub. This. That's what it says. <laughs> I don't know how to say that. We're gonna skip it. Uh, his panic fading now that there was no sound of Filch and Snake, Harry moved nearer to the, to the mirror, wanting to look at himself, but see no reflection again. He stepped in front of it. He had to clap his hands around his mouth to stop him from screaming. He whirled around, his heart pounding far more furiously than when the book had screamed, for he had not seen only himself in the mirror but a whole crowd of people standing right behind him. But the room was empty. Breathing very fast, he turned around back to the mirror. There he was, reflected in it, white and scared looking, and over there, reflected behind him, were at least 10 others. Harry looked over his shoulder, but no one was there. Or were they all invisible too? Was he in fact in a room full of invisible people? And this mirror's trick is that it reflected them invisible or not. He looked into the mirror again. A woman standing right behind him, uh, right behind his reflection was smiling and waving. He reached out and a hand, uh, he reached out a hand and felt the air behind him. If she was really there, he'd touch her. Their reflections were so close together, but he only felt air and she was, uh, she and the others existed only in the mirror. She was a very pretty woman. She had dark hair, red hair, and her eyes, her eyes are just like mine, Harry thought, edging a little closer to the glass, bright green, exactly the same shape. But then he noticed that she was crying, smiling, but crying at the same time. A thin, black-haired man stood next to her and put his arm around her. He wore glasses, and his hair was very untidy. It stuck up in the back, just like Harry's did. Harry was so close to the mirror now that his nose was nearly touching that of his reflection. Mum, he whispered. 
Dad? They just looking at him, smiling, and slowly Harry looked into the faces of other people in the mirror and saw other pairs of green eyes like his, other noses like his, even little old man who looked as though he had Harry's knobbly knees. Harry was looking at his family for the first time in his life. The potter smiled and waved at Harry as he stared hungrily back at them. He's, uh, his hands pressed flat against the glass, though he hoped was hoping to fall right through them and out and reach them. He had a powerful kind of ache inside him, half joy, half terrible sadness. How long he stood there, he didn't know. The reflections did not fade, and he looked until a distant noise brought him back to his senses. He couldn't stay here. He had to find his way back to bed. He tore his eyes from his mother's face and whispered, I'll come back, and hurried from the room. Okay. Oh, I'm probably done. Um, but that was chapter 12. Um, reading is tiring, but I think I did it for like 30 minutes or so. Um, so I hope you enjoyed. It was very fun. Um, and I'm sorry, I haven't seen any of your comments, but yeah, um, maybe I'll do it again. Sorry for my terrible British accent, but, um, I love Harry Potter and I'm rereading the books right now, so I just thought I would join, let you guys join. I don't even know what I'm saying right now. How can I read good? I read so bad. This is like, like chalkboard nails. Like I'm terrible at it. Um, but I hope you guys had fun and I'm sorry it was kind of a boring chapter. I'll read it again when we get to like the really juicy, juicy stuff. Um, yeah, I hope you guys have a really great day. I'll see you soon. Bye.